And you guys are live. Welcome. Happy Thursday, uh, Living Soil Nerds. Uh, shout out to Peter. I know that he's uh, shortly going to be on an airplane going out to visit his father. Uh, I believe that his father is turning 91. Wow. Uh, so that's pretty cool, man. We also, our, our guest host today, obviously, is London. So we appreciate you filling in, sir. Uh, always helping out the community. You can check out his shows also on Future Cannabis Project. Uh, just a lot of time and uh, effort goes into his show. So uh, this community is continuing to grow a lot more uh, shows, if you will. You know, there's basically two channels now. So a lot of variety out there. And uh, please continue to let others know uh, about this channel, because I think that's um, really the main thing that it, that has allowed us late in, in just one year uh, with Peter and, and um Chad Westport in London and uh, James Loud and a, and a variety of other people to where a lot more people are using this as a kind of a gateway or a way to peek into deep diving deeper into complex subjects. I know for a few months now, I've been behind the scenes trying to get uh, somebody that really understands glomalin. Uh, it's something that was just discovered in 1996 uh, by Sarah Wright. So uh, for you kind of extra nerds out there, kind of, you know, maybe we should research a little bit more on that and uh, about uh, Miss Wright. Uh, but for the most part, it seems like this is a new phenomenon, relatively speaking. It's something that a lot of us don't understand. And, uh, you know, to be candid with all of our viewers, no one uh, felt comfortable to come on and talk about this until I uh, kind of reached out to Leighton and said, well, let's do like at least a one on one or, a, you know, a one oh. 101 version of this with uh, just myself and you and uh, we'll try to talk about this complex subject and, and break things down on, on a very basic level and then hopefully with this show and maybe continuing to reach out we can find somebody that really understands what's going on uh, on a deeper level there because it is pretty magical and it's something that seems like it is uh, self-created and again it comes back to carbon and how that you know we were using more of an analogy that it's uh, like the currency, if you will, of the soil food web. So once we built that rhizosphere, that's why I wanted to kind of take it to the next level and understand what happens once that rhizosphere is built. Uh, what happens when our muscular mycorrhizal fungi is now present and, and what starts to be created when that goes on. So I wanted to start there, uh, Leighton. And again, I appreciate you, buddy, uh, taking complex subjects and being, billing, being willing to talk about this and you know, the beauty of this is it seems like not too many people really even understand this. So if we say some stuff that eventually isn't right, you know, uh, we were kind of talking yesterday about some old gospel and some things that used to be tried and true in the cannabis world that things have changed. Uh, but for the most part, it seems like this, uh, you know, this rabbit hole that we're about to go down is one that no one seems to understand. But at the same time, people are on all of it. Uh, and just what is kind of created with these glues and how things are be able to kind of hold on to one another. So I wanted to let you kind of maybe talk about our muscular uh, mycorrhizal fungi first and kind of explain what that is and, and maybe piggyback from last week about the rhizosphere and once everything is created, now how things kind of maybe go more into that fiber optic network uh, where there's a life, everything's alive and thriving, and now it's more about uh, storing carbon, storing um, nitrogen, that kind of stuff. Oh, shit. Here we go. <laughs> uh, it goes back to what we talked about last session. Where does the plant end and where does the soil begin or vice versa? And there is no true answer to that question. So um, let's we'll start with carbon. We're going to be dancing all around carbon today, but we're not going to actually dive down that rabbit hole because it's a really deep one. So <clears throat> with the basic understanding that every living thing on this planet has a carbon to nitrogen ratio and that carbons, the individual atoms bond together to create carbon chains or molecules. So that gets really complex real quick. Um, reeling it in and understanding the difference between um, endo and ecto mycorrhizae. So these are ancient strategies, at least 400 million years old um, in evolutionary processes where uh, the one endo um, created a relationship with the inner part of the plant. So it goes inside the root um, where it exchanges um, 
complex uh, compounds. And the other um, disassociated to some degree with the plant in the essence that it doesn't go inside the cells. Um, it actually coats the outside of the roots. Um, and it's really kind of cool. You can see it by the eye, whereas the endo you cannot see. Um, mycelium means a cord, so more than one body. Um, so if two mycorrhizae uh, individual hyphae wrapped around each other, that would be considered mycelium. Um, so those are some of the beginning definitions of, of, uh, this complex topic. So yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, 1996 was the first time that, um, this glue, uh, for lack of better words, was discovered and began to get studied In basic reduction science. We try to take everything apart down to its finest piece and now we've established something, but in this process or the discussion of glomalin, you got to pull way back out and, and understand that it's way more complex and more geobiochemical reactions that's happening. Um, and I want to give a big shout out to my study group, uh, Craig Tester and Leif Olson, who on some point I will um, get them together and we can probably go a lot deeper down this rabbit hole. Um, unfortunately, both of them work um, or, or are in college, so they don't have the opportunity to do it during the day like this. Uh, so it would probably be a clubhouse at night or something, but we'll, we'll figure out when and, and we can go a lot deeper down this rabbit hole. Um, so I'm gonna stay very general today. Um, so what we do know, uh, what we do know is that glomulin is on both the inner and outer shells of mycorrhizae are vascular mycorrhizae so the endo not the ecto uh, ecto does not make glomulin and nor do saprophytes or saprobes um, so this is specific to am fungi and we believe or we know that the properties of glomulin um, are both uh, water highly water resistant and highly adaptive to bonding, uh, so glues. So here's, here's another great example of, of trying to understand um, some of the properties of this. Um, you know, when you take a piece of wood and you glue it together with regular wood glue, um, sometimes you'll get an interaction where the glue actually penetrates into the fiber of the wood. And when you snap that glue joint, some of that wood will be stuck on the other piece of wood. So that's like a molecular bond. That's where the bond is, is very strong. Um, another example of that is welding. So when you weld two pieces of metal together, um, it's very difficult to get them apart. And glomulin has that ability in soils. Um, it can take clay particles, silt particles, organic matter, whatever, and create this incredibly strong bond that is both... Um, essentially waterproof or very, very water resistant, um, but also provides a lot of um, incredible interactions between the carbon, which is perhaps the organic matter, um, as well as um, the roots themselves. And, and they, they in turn help support the creation of aggregates or micro or macro aggregates. Now, this is where it gets really fucking complex. Um, again, it's, it's a geobiochemical reaction that's, that's occurring. And so what happens is this glomulin will help to create these aggregates. The aggregates themselves are less likely to dehydrate. So therefore, they are better at holding um, water in, inside them. So we're into like a... A hydrophilic um, area where where we're actually holding moisture in and this gets back to why aggregation is so important in soil um, aggregation provides pore space for gas exchange so that's oxygen to penetrate down into the soil and co2 to escape the soil um, as well as um, 
you know, providing infiltration of water, which is really important. So the water doesn't just run off the soil, it, it actually infiltrates in, and then it gets absorbed into these micro and macro aggregates. So that's why, um, you know, this is, this is the, the fungal component of biofilms. Now, this is where it gets really fucked up. Um, the latest work uh, in studying this phenomenon called glomulin, um, it's kind of clear now that there are a lot of interactions outside of this one material. In other words, you can't say when you extract glomulin from soil, oh, hey, take it easy, buddy, um, that it's just glomulin because it isn't. They, they, when they extract it, they've found that there's a lot of humic uh, particles or molecules mixed in with it that, that are basically not removable. So this is again, where do you where do you define the end of the word glomulin in a system where you've extracted it? And this gets even more complex when you start talking about extracting glomulin from spores. Um, really interesting study done in China in 2018, I believe, where they extracted glomulin from spores and from soil. Um, and it's kind of complex in the soil. Um, you have to use a uh, an acid. Um, and a tremendous amount of heat. I think it's about 250 degrees. Hey, Poe, it's okay, buddy. So that shows you how resistant this is. Uh, it's very highly water resistant. Uh, it's very heat um, resistant um, and provides a very complex association between not only bacteria and biofilms, but also eukaryotes, which live in those biofilms and are also. Uh, it's indicated that they are, their excretion is also part of this geobiochemical uh, reaction that's occurring. So back to the study, um, they, they took not only glomulin harvested from soil, but also harvested from spores, and they foliarly sprayed it on um, oranges. And what was really cool about this was they had a tremendous increase in uh, fruit size and color. But the real interesting thing is they had a wicked increase in nutrient density in foods. Now, to, to actually extract this and, and, and try to do this on a commercial scale would be, you know, just ridiculously expensive and not realistic. Um, maybe in the future, uh, there will be ways of doing this uh, more cost effectively. Uh, but, you know, here again, this goes back to trying to answer some of the most important things for the future of all humanity is how do we get nutrient dense foods and so that goes back to having you know a really biologically diverse and rich system that allows these geo bio chemical reactions to occur um, producing secondary tertiary etc metabolites that are allowed uh, the plant to um, absorb those nutrients that we so desperately need to get back into our food chain so I thought that was really cool. Um, and again, understanding that these are in um, obviously no till circumstances. So if you're tilling, you're, you're destroying your mycorrhizae network and you're never going to really get that potential or plant potential or benefit from, from the association. So back to glomulin. So we know it's on the inside and the outside of the filament called the hyphae of um, the mycorrhizae, the AM. Um, we also know that bacteria can penetrate or is sometimes allowed to penetrate that, that hyphae. Um, so from the outside to the inside or vice versa, kind of similar to endophytes or endo, endophytic, uh, endophytic bacteria, biology. So there, there again, these are very, very complex processes that we're just starting to learn. So Who's in charge of glomulin production? Is it the is it the relationship between the fungi and the bacteria? Um, I would tend to say probably. Um, can one happen without the other? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think science has the answer to that. Um, but obviously, like earlier stated, um, inside the spore is a no, whole other world that we have yet to 
um, begin to explore because we just don't have the technology or tools to do it. So obviously there's some, some pretty complex um, relationships that we um, may never be able to explain. Uh, hopefully, hopefully at some point in time, <laughs> if it's not too late, um, that we do get to a point where we can uh, really understand more about those processes. And I, I truly believe that that'll go back to um, interdisciplinary science, not not reductionist science. Uh, when when groups of of individuals come together, um, I think that that will be the the thing that turns this uh, these mysteries around uh, a lot. So a lot more so than just reductionist approaches. So that being said, um, we have this compound, this very complex compound that that is um, of huge benefit to the relationship between plants and soil um, and is absent in, in you know, present day agriculture for the most part. And even if, you know, I, there's a big push out here in, in SoCal because it's such so heavy ag uh, industry in this area um, to introduce mycorrhizae to uh, field crops. Um, but I think that the push to sell products is greater than the understanding or realization of these products. In other words, the farmer, you tell them, hey, you spray this mycorrhizae, you're going to get a 30% increase in yield, blah, 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 less water. It's all true, but then they till the field and you've got to use it again. And the other side of that coin is that we know it takes pretty much 90 days for a complete association to occur. So that's the association of the penetration into the root. And then the filaments go out and they start collecting uh the nutrients that they dissolve with their acids and the food that's provided to them from the plant in the form of exudate. So again, this is bio geo chemical processes. So very complex. Um, and so for the most part, yeah, there's uh, a lot of these ag companies are, are starting to introduce uh, mycorrhizae products into, um, you know, regular uh, ag culture, which is, which is good, but I just, I think that they missed the point that you've really got to push beyond just introducing biology or, or uh, you know, organisms into the soil. You've got to change the practice of tillage. And that's going to be um, a bit more complex because the ag is, is in order for a company to um, be successful, they obviously have to make a profit. And so, when you look at no-till practices and the small margins that these farmers have to make a profit, it's very difficult to tell them to leave their feed field to fallow or to uh, put in a cover crop and wait three months and then um, roll it or crimp it um, and use that plant residue as a um, organic mulch and or um, allow the, the, the soil underneath to continue functioning um, at a highly biological level. They just, they're just not going to probably do that. So, um, the chances of, um, uh, traditional ag to ever get to the point where we go back to nutrient dense foods, the value of those foods would have to increase to the point where, um, those farmers could, uh, have these types of practices where they're not pushing that soil that dirt to just never ending production of one plant after another after another after another so <clears throat> again you know i'm going off topic a little bit but i want you to understand the the the, the value of this particular compound in, in soils because again it creates this aggregation it creates gas exchange it creates uh, water holding capacity but that's where the magic comes in. Again, it's it's what's happening inside that aggregate. Um, you're dealing with a, a whole other universe of interactions between all of these microbes, um, not just the bacteria and the fungi, but the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, et cetera. Um, you know, another comparison that, that might be beneficial um, to the audience is the understanding of worms. Um, worms in many way uh, um, excrete a, a substance, a glue that's, that's similar to glomulin um, that helps bond the particles together. And, and a, a prime example of that is the worm casting. The casting itself is a microaggregate. And that microaggregate can form 
into a, a macro aggregate very quickly because it's already got some surface area for other um, microbes to colonize and biofilm and expand, expand, expand. And that's, you know, just part of, of this uh, combination or, or symphony of all of the organisms working together. Um, another interesting um, component of glomulin is its ability to uptake metals. Um, so we know that there's, uh, I think, somewhere between uh, a few and as high as uh, 10 to 11 percent iron in glomulin and now there's also other metals and this also brings in a more complex conversation about uh mycorrhizae uh am uh, harvesting um, toxins heavy metals from soil and tying them up um, but if you have a dynamic accumulator like a cannabis plant um, the potential for that cannabis plant to pull up all of these tiny little pieces of metal that have been bonded together by the mycorrhizae in the form of glomulin um, could potentially have some some risks or some uh, cross contamination that, that could occur. Um, but back to the point that it is believed that the iron is what helps this glue to bond and be both heat resistant and water resistant at a, at a very high level. Um, and also it's, it's, uh, interesting to think of it as like, um, say structure. So we all know if you have a, a chasm and, and if you had a giant iron beam, you could slide that beam out over that cavern until it got to the other side where it would now hold weight. And so when looking at, um, the ability of mycorrhizae AM specifically to, um, grow out or traverse an aggregate, um, there's pore space in there. So that, that mycorrhizae has to grow across that chasm. So that iron may be the critical component that allows it to um, defy gravity, for lack of better words, and, and span to, you know, two banks um, inside a very microscopic world. So as you can see this is this is not an easy subject um yeah exactly you know, it's it's really complex and again we we are just starting down the understanding of these interactions these you know geo biological chemical um, interactions that are are causing these kinds of things to happen and these interactions are only occurring with amf right um no i mean so glomalin can be made from other well back to the conversation last week right um the rhizosphere the rhizosphere could be as great as the amount of moisture being held in the soil or as small as just the slimy coating on the root itself right so that interaction between the bacteria uh, penetrating the outer wall of the fungi and interacting with the cytoplasm on the inside, you know, that's again, it's, it's really fucking complex. <clears throat> so back to the question, where's, where's the plant end and the soil begin? Where, where does the, where's the fungi stand alone? And I, I, I don't think we can have an answer to that. I mean, we know it has to have a, it has to have a host plant. We know that for a fact. Um, but once that host plant and the fungi start to interact, who's to say what's happening with the cytoplasm on the inside or the biofilm on the outside? Again, that, that, that fungi has to have its own rhizosphere. Um, we've seen that in films showing biology traveling back and forth on the outside of that filament, right? So, you know, again, this gets super complex, but for the lack of, of a better understanding on a, on a layman's terms is that glomulin has this incredible ability to bond soil particulate together to create micro and macro aggregates, which is the key to a successful plant soil interaction. You can't have one without the other. You just can't. And that's like 
that is the utopia that's being built, right? Is that do you feel like that's the right kind of yeah eyes yeah. on this? Is that yeah, I mean, go back a thousand years when we had you know incredible diversity and interaction between plants and animals and humans. Um, you know, that's that's why the Garden of Eden was here, was because of these very complex, um, again, geo biochemical reactions that were occurring um, that allowed the evolution of all things on this planet. So the storing of carbon is basically mother nature's way of like, all right, everybody's rich now. They like the, the super highways built, uh, we're storing things, we're continuing to branch out, we're going deeper. Uh, that was something that Dr. Elaine Ingham had mentioned that you know, before we mess with the old growth forests, those those trees would go down so deep, obviously mirroring one another. Um, but nowadays, with uh, any kind of conventional things that's being sprayed, she, she had said that maybe the, the roots go down a couple of feet at best and then branch out because of how polluted, how um, like impaction and all that kind of stuff that's impaction. created over the years. Or compaction, yeah. So when this compaction happens, that's actually the way that Mother Nature combats that stuff, from what I understand, is that it's using the glomlin, it's using the mycorrhizal fungi, specifically the AMF, to start to create that wonder, that magic again, like you had mentioned. Like, And it really does seem like magic, because once everything is created, Dr. Lane have talked about how it's really hard for disease and pests to, to really infect anything because it's such a super highway. Everything is moving. Everybody's uh, feeling great and, and with a little money in their pocket that it's really hard for the bad, uh, bad world, if you will, to be able to even notice what's going on because there's just so much uh, good microbes working in a symbiotic relationship. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> I think I think it's more complex. Um, yeah, for studies, sure. But... Studies have shown that um, you know some of these fungi can actually be pathogenic um, in numbers, and so you know if the plant um, associates with this mycorrhizae, and the mycorrhizae goes out um, or fueled, or it, the mycorrhizae fueled by the exudates from the plant. So that could be up to 20% of the photosynthesis that happened, the energy that was created by the plant um, to go out and explore and grow out and harvest nutrients. Well, if that mycorrhizae gets to a point where it can't find what the plant wants, um, it's now pathogenic. It's now using the plant's energy um, to continue to grow its own biomass um, with no return to the plant. So that's pathogenic. And so that happens a lot in nature. And um, you get into the discussion of like fusarium. Fusarium in the uh, highly saprobe environment can actually reverse and become a saprobe and start feeding back other uh, parts of the soil feb, soil food web, um, nutrients. So, you know, again, it's just a very, very complex and delicate, um, arrangement that that's happening. And so to say, you, I, you, you just can't be, you can't be more open-minded or we need to be open, really open-minded about how complex the subject is and not try to reduce it or narrow it to one scenario. Because as we all know, there's exceptions to all the rules um, in, in nature and outside of nature. So, uh, <laughs> in, a, in a living soil system, let's say all, all I, conditions are ideal. How long would it take for all of this to, to occur? Are we talking years? Does this start off after I a couple of months? I would say that if, if you looked at um, a decimated site, uh, Mount St. Helens, right? She blew up, man. She, she took out half the mountain. Um, how long did it take for that site to recover to the health that it has now? Yeah, it was years, brother. And and even now, you couldn't go there and say that it was exactly the same way as it was before the eruption. So again, it's like, uh, wh where does it start and where does it end? And I don't think that there... I, I think this is more like a figure eight, dude. It's not a line. It doesn't start and end. 
it's interwoven and and where the, the eight comes together you have a cycle on the left and a cycle on the right but you also can change cycles that you can go to the yin or the yang of it so it, it's it dude you know i told you man i told you this was fucking gonna be a hard conversation to have <laughs> well I, again i want the audience to know like nobody really wanted to to speak on this in a manner of where they would have to answer questions or speak on it like how you are today it's just, just so much unknown There's so, so much unknown. I mean, I know we don't really understand anything from a soil scientist's point of view, but 1996 seems pretty new just to, hey, by the right. way, there's all this other world that we we just kind of figured out. And that's what I think is really cool. You know, maybe I didn't understand when I was younger about how important the rainforest is. And, the, you know, there's probably a variety of things out there that we don't even know about. So, you know, that's the interesting thing is that I, and Afrin can talk on this. I think we have, we have, we believe <clears throat> that we have identified about 5% of the fungal species on the planet. Wow. Um, but the interesting thing is, as we discover more, um, we're realizing that that's actually a lower percentage because there's a lot of them that we haven't even discovered yet. So again, where, 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 where do we, how can we make such grand claims when we know so little? And, you know, that goes back into bro science. And Craig bitch slapped me hard this morning. He gave me a cho slap because he's like, basically, <laughs> look, dude, you know, we cannot be so narrow minded to think that, that this one interaction is causing everything. It is. It's, it's, it's so fucking complex that, you know, you take one one component, you take the fish out of the river, you take the deer out of the forest, you've changed everything. Because now, you know, that fish isn't eating the aquatic plants or other fish and releasing nutrients that are available to the plants and vice versa. The deer is not eating the leaves and pooping and leaving that behind for the microbes. So pulling one thing out in a reductionist uh, traditional approach um, you've changed everything else. I, I love the saying by observing you've changed it. And, and, and it's kind of fucked up to think about like you walk out into nature and just the fact that you're present, you have changed the environment. You've changed everything. Some of the animals have scurried away. You've compacted the soil underneath your foot. Um, just you breathing the air and stealing the oxygen out of that environment and changing it. Um, so Again, that's the way you really need to approach conversations like this, where we know so little that you don't try to reduce anything. Try to look at, try to look, zoom out and look at the big picture, right? Um, and and then go back at it with the approach or understanding that all these tiny little interactions are adding up to all of these big, big things that are happening. So yeah, it's. This is a deep one, dude. That carbon carbon rabbit hole is even fucking deeper. <laughs> it's it's just pretty interesting how um, you know once everything is stabilized, everything's alive. It's kind of like I guess anything in in nature. Now it needs to store things, squirrel away, you know, nuts for in case for a hard winter, um, and the the plant even at the soil level seems to be doing that. And then when I started to learn more about like, I guess for a lack of a better term, it's considered like the old growth forest. And how everything is put, you know, all the energy, especially in weeds, is put at the top of the soil. And then as things progress later down the line, especially when you get to the older forest, the variety or the most of the um, the photosynthesis energy that's going down is going down to create a variety of different um, exudates for that soil system. So we as cannabis farmers, I feel like this is kind of that extra little secret sauce or things that we can look forward to by putting in the time and effort and creating these uh, soil systems in our basements, tents, maybe even a larger commercial facility, knowing that our end goal is to create these little extra super highways where we're, now we're even storing carbon and we're, we're, you know, creating enough currency that it seems like everything is alive and thriving. And then when those um, indoor facilities seem to take off, it does somewhat feel like a, a rainforest, if you will. Everything is very lush in there. Um, so 
is this next level thinking for the newer farmer that might just have got into this to maybe even start researching this? And then for the advanced farmer, we all need to start researching this as a group to, to try to understand how these things are being mined, how these things are being shipped around that soil system. Because that does seem like the the caveat, the aha moment of, of becoming a living soil farmer is getting more of that fungal aspect. And for a long time, it seemed like everybody just pitched the bacterial aspect. Agreed, Brian. Agreed. Um, yeah, I truly believe that, again, <laughs> buyer beware. Um, if you are going to take the no-till living soils approach, uh, make sure that you are getting products that actually have value to them. Um, I have tested, I don't know how many different uh, mycorrhizae project products um, out of pocket just because I wanted to know if they were value or they had value or because people were hitting me up and saying, hey, you know, I, I want to use this product, but does it work or how how beneficial is it? And I would send it off to Efren and say, hey, do a spore count. And, and one of the really interesting things is um, there's a company out of Mexico producing a mycorrhizae uh, that is basically being treated as if it's like the coca-cola formula um this guy found these this particular or i think it's four four species um i believe it was in afghanistan or pakistan some really really fucking arid dry nasty place um and has colonized them and i don't know if they're in vivo or in vitro um, but i sent the product off to efren and he came back and said there's no spores in it I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, no, there's no spores in it. I go, what do you mean? And he's like, well, the spores that I found appear to be more like a um, yeast spore. So they're very small. They're under 20 microns. And he goes, AM is, is generally 60 to 80 microns. So I have to throw this out and say that that's not a mycorrhizae spore. That's another type of spore from something else, whether it's a saprobe yeast or, um, you know, a, a slime mold or something else. A mold, excuse me, not a slime mold. Slime molds are a whole fuck another ball game. That's they're like those uh, uh, lichen. <laughs> Lichen's a combination of three organisms: uh, bacteria, bacteria, fungi, fungi, yeast, bacteria. Really fucking complex interactions. Um, so back to the, to the point at hand is that, um, you know, for, for the, for the farmer who has decided that I want to go with a, a living no-till system, um, I need products that, that actually work. Oh, and, and the, I'm sorry, I didn't make the point on this, on this fungi. Um, apparently the, the gentleman that sold that to me or gave it to me to test, um, has said that he's had incredible plant reactions in strawberries, raspberries, and blueberries, which blueberries are weird because they're, they don't associate with mycorrhizae. Uh, they associate with um, ah, fuck, Iroquois, Iroquois fungi, which is a whole other subject that we haven't even begun to, to broach or very little is being done on it, similar to, similar to Guam. There's just not enough people studying it. There just doesn't seem to be a demand. But needless to say, um, and I haven't had that conversation with Efren yet about, you know, this interaction, because I'm going to go harvest uh, some roots from a, uh, one of his side-by-side uh, -side trials and send those to Efren and have him uh, dye them and, and see if there is some kind of interaction that, that maybe he's overlooked. Maybe this is a new type of fungi, uh, AM, that, that had yet to be discovered. Um, so... You know, there's still a lot we need to learn. We need to really uh, put our backs into this. And I think that as a community, the cannabis community should and needs to get um, a closer relationship with um, the academia world so that some of the stuff can be documented. Um, you know, that, that's been a, a point of contention with, with me at the all the regen conferences i was like you you farmers have got to start working with academia to start documenting the value of this and you know the problem is there's so little follow-through like you know yeah i'm going to send this plant off to be tested for 
cannabinoids, uh, levels, and heavy metals, and pesticides, right? Well, it costs so much to do that that you can't sit there and test every chemovar or chemotaxis or cultivar um, to see the interactions between just the plant and the soil, let alone the plant, the soil, the microbes, and everything else. I mean, it's 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 a challenge to say the least. So where does that money come from? Who who puts up the money to do these expensive testing? Um, and again, broad scale testing, not just cannabinoid production, um, but the plant interactions, the colonization, you know, soil food web, all of these things, as well as the soil chemistry. Because again, it's geochemical biological processes that are creating these. And it goes back to the soil horizons, the horizontal system. If you don't have sand, silt, and clay in your soil, then how do you think you possibly could hit the potential of that genetic? Um, and if you if you have all those things and you don't have biology, how do you think you're going to have the potential of that genetic expression? You can't. So <clears throat> you really need all of these things to be in play so that you can let the genetic potential of this plant or any plant for that matter to be expressed. And that goes back to whether it's cannabinoid productions or nutrients and vitamins and minerals in, in what we consume. Uh, and for you guys out there that want to see what uh, Layton's talking about, there's a uh, few uh, glomalin uh, quick YouTube videos where they're showing basically that sand is now being glued together. Uh, pretty interesting to see they're holding it down and who knows how long that that took but this is the part that i feel i don't i mean i, I guess people would talk about this they would talk about glomalin a few years ago people would say yeah that's a that's a good thing but no one really ever tried to explain this to each other and again Leighton, i appreciate you man because it it, it seems like th this is the extra factories that we want. So we've been talking about the soil food web for a long time. Well, this is that next level. So when the soil food web is built and it's alive, it's thriving. Now, now is the time to uh, figure that out uh, from a fungal aspect. So do you feel like if you're, you're a cannabis farmer, you really want to do this on your own, then going out into mother nature, you can find, uh, I always called it, I always heard it as AMF, but you've been just saying AM. So AM fungi, uh, is that an easy thing to, to get from mother nature? Um, so if you're in nature, those spores can travel by air or water. Um, that's how they traverse the planet. Now take it to the next level. They can travel on bugs. They can travel on animals. So when we goes back to when we had our mass expansion <clears throat> and we no longer have mass migrations, um, the ability for those spores to continue to spread is greatly reduced. So can you get it out of nature? Yeah, that's it's the same concept of it as an IMO collection. Um, is there going to be mycorrhizae in an IMO collection? I'm sure there is going to be some. But again, like the, the, the latest and greatest information on mycorrhizae is that it can be parasitic, it can do nothing, or it can be beneficial. As long as you have the right type, and again, we know what, 5% at best? So how, how many types do you really need and, and how many um, potential uh, beneficials are you gonna get? And that's where, uh, you know, companies like Bioratus have, have spent years working on developing um, ways to um, produce these types of products um, that are going to show a beneficial effect and not a parasitic effect. And so if you go collect it in nature, what are you collecting, right? You could be potentially collect pathogens and, and Dr. Lane will talk a lot about this, you know, and, and I tend to be a little bit more ballsy and in trusting the process and trusting mother nature that she's not going to send me down the wrong rabbit hole. And that gets back into spirituality and your connection with the earth and your soul. And so it, it's again, a super complex issue. Um, some of the, some of the most uh, important work that I think that as a, 
farmer or um, a new grower or even an, an old grower that that's looking to up its game into this you know really super um diverse microbial living soil is the understanding that there is succession in soil um, and then there's succession in biology so this type of biology has to be present in order for the next succession to come in does that mean the first succession is wiped out Maybe in some cases, sure. And in other cases, no, they, they remain symbiotic and, and they help each other mutual, mutualistically move forward down that succession toward that old growth forest. And I know we go, we use the old growth forest as, as the example, um, but maybe we should be looking more at trying to get somewhere in the middle based on the plant that we're trying to rear. Uh, so the canvas plant in nature um, often isn't seasonal. It, it, it's, you know, some of the old land raised plants just keep growing. They don't die in, a, uh, you know, at the end of the season. Um, so it's more like a shrub um, or, or a, a small bush or tree than it is uh, a seasonal plant. Now we, we have uh, pushed it, uh, to a point where we, through photo period, we, we get the flower and then we harvest and cure and dry and joy. But in nature, it, it didn't really work that way with, with the original land race cannabis plants. Now, I'm not to say that there weren't cultivars that didn't die off every season. I'm not saying that. Um, but I'm telling you right now, there were certain cultivars that didn't die. And continue to grow and, and go through the cycle, go back to flower, go back to veg, go back to flower, go back to veg. So, um, you know, I would say that if, if you were, if you were smart, you would take the approach that you want somewhere in the middle of succession uh, of, of the plant successional chart. The successional chart is basically brassicas, uh, you know, water plants um, are very, very high bacteria. And then the old growth forest is very, very high fungal. So you need to be somewhere in the middle there. And so if you're not employing, you know, or, or, or collecting and using sapro, sapros, decomposer fungi, mycorrhizae fungi, yeasts, molds, um, all of the host of different types of bacteria that you can, you know, collect yourself, um, then you're potentially leaving out a piece of that um, secret sauce that, that allows genetic potential to be expressed. Can you get all of that from like old Alaskan humus? Is that, is that an easier uh, way to right. do it? So, so again, you got to think about this. Um, there are certain species of biology that are consistent around the globe but there are a lot that are very unique to that one area, to that microclimate or, or you know, larger scale area. So, you know, to, to say oh, I'm going to collect a, a micro from Alaska and put it in my indoor tent in, in you know, whatever, wherever, um, I may not survive. But again, now you've provided a biostimulant, which is another thing that you really need to think about is that 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 organism may not have colonized, but that organism harvested something from somewhere else that probably has value in the pantry of another uh, prokaryote or bacteria or nematode. So this goes back to all the way back to the beginning. A bacteria mines nutrients from sand, silt, and clay and organic matter and stores them in its pantry so that if it runs into a situation where it's too hot, too cold, not enough water, too much water, pH swing, it can pull out those elements out of its pantry to shore up its shell or, or, or go into cyst um, to survive that change. So, you know, the benefit of pulling that microbe from Alaska and throwing it in your tent probably has more to do with providing um, a level of nutrient, a uh, mineral or, or a vitamin, even a secondary tertiary metabolite that was not present in that soil system until you introduced it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Dude, this I is kind of fun, this, man. 
Yeah, this this is a fucking topic, man. This is one fucking hell of a topic. I mean, people have spent their whole lives researching just one tiny aspect of this in the reductionist approach. And they could speak for hours or days, weeks or months on, on that, their one aspect of it. So to be sweeping with with brush strokes this big is is you know really really challenging to say the least but I think it's an important conversation to have because it expands your own thinking about what you're actually doing and maybe you're being a reductionist when you need to be you know more interdisciplinary and and take into consideration the value of companion plants and banker plants and diverse uh, ecosystems and, and diversity in microbes. I mean, working with this guy right now, making a uh, biological compost and I had to beat into his head. I'm like, look, I want you to get a baggie of every different type of green plant you can find and then build a huge pile with it. Right. That's a fucking challenge. Right. What an asshole I am. But I, I'm trying to prove a point that, that if you leave something out, you're potentially not putting something into play that very well be very valuable. And so diversity, diversity, diversity. And if, if, if I can't beat that into everybody's head, it's hard enough. Um, I'm sorry, but that, I think that is the key to full genetic expression or potential is, is, is through diversity and then, then trusting the process that you've, you've made your effort. And again, if you're, if you are, um, very, in tune with nature then she'll talk to you man she'll fucking tell you oh no no don't pick that pick this so you know again it's it's a heightened awareness that that you need to protect yourself from doing something stupid uh, more often than not just sheer laziness is the is is the cause of a lot of problems um when you're not putting your your best foot forward um, yeah, I don't feel like watering the plant today. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like making compost or I don't feel like going, you know, five miles down the road to, to harvest this weird plant that I saw out of the corner of my eye. Now, why did you see that plant? Is that your intuition telling you? Probably. Um, we as a species have lost touch with our intuition. Um, and that's what got us to the point where we basically took the fuck over, right? I mean, we, we are on every fucking place on this planet. There's a humans and there's human civilizations, whether they're oil rigs, whether they're, you know, research centers, uh, you know, we got, we, we're everywhere. And, and then even where we aren't, <laughs> we are. Th think about the, the fucking nuclear submarines that, that go underneath the ice shelves and pop up, right? So we've affected everything on so many levels and we have lost our, our, connection um the ancient ways uh, the use of of herbs in medicine instead of chemical compounds derived from those fucking herbs so uh you know i think that's that is the that is the one takeaway that i could give today is that you know learn to use your intuition and i'm sure all of you out there have had this happen where you you're walking out the door and you see something out of the corner of your eye and you don't know why you looked at it, but then you left and you went about your day and all of a sudden you're like, fuck, if I had had that right now, right? Has that happened to you, Brian? Yeah, I've definitely felt intuition before, like in life and, and just um, and when you didn't knowing just... certain things that you need to like, you know, I almost feel like that's your... Um, I don't want to go too deep in this because you know how people, but I do believe that there's something that, that kind of looks out for you because I've experienced that twice in my life, whether you believe that's a gardening angel or what, whatever your belief system is, but it does feel that way. And I, it's always made me wonder if intuition is whatever that thing is that's being like, hey, you know, like, don't go down that alley or, you know, there's just little things in life that I've, I felt like I've listened to that and I've, I, you know, still here today. So that, that worked out. Um, how do you, I, I don't want to change the subject too big, but carbon is such an interesting thing to me, especially it seems like um, when things are being built up, why, why do you think mother nature uh, feels like she needs to store it so much? Because the, the little basic veil that I understand of this stuff is the, the deeper you get into soil systems, carbon is where it's at. 
And then once that is start to be built, it seems like the overall health, the immunity, everything is is now next level. And as the years go by, things just improve. So they level up until you're like at a level nine, level 10, where uh, farming is easily managed. And, you know, that's where some of the older heads that we've even had on this show where they talk about, you know, they're they're farming a decent sized square footage and there's maybe two or three people managing it. Once you've gotten to that level, that's again where the profits come in. So it's, you know, probably spend a lot of money to get the the best of the best. Uh, And then as the years go by, you realize that these things are building up. Uh, And then that was another question I wanted to reach out to you, Leighton, is so no till you're still disturbing a lot of that stuff when you're taking the plants out. So, you know, Steve Cantwell was talking about, you know, he's using basically that soil system and then just using the pots and changing out the pots. So technically, he's not really disturbing that. Do you feel like maybe that's some of his advantage over others? Because his stuff obviously is usually 10 out of 10. Smells fantastic. So do you think he's getting more of this glomalin and all these other things that you would get after a? he's probably on his 27th, 28th cycle? Uh, do you feel like that because he's not even disturbing it now like we had done before? So he's taking it to the next level where... Yeah, it was no till now it's, you know, not touching anything and just removing the pots on top of that soil system. So it's not disturbed. Is that uh, a- I, I think, yeah, I think you're spot on. And, and again, <clears throat> carbon is in every living thing. We all have a CDN ratio. So think about the fertility that occurs when an animal dies and basically falls down or gets eaten, but there's parts and pieces left all over the place, that fertility. Um, another like really complex one is, is the understanding of, of again, like uh, buffaloes, herds. Um, so these animals come in, they eat, they thrash, they trash, they poop, they give birth, uh, the milk from the mother is spilled all over the place. There's blood spilled all over the place because other predators come in and feed off them. So it's really just a shit show of, of carbon and nitrogen being released into the environment. And that's where, you know, this incredible diverse fertility comes from is that, that cycle of nature, that, that infinity signal, you know, um where is it at any one given point in time sometimes it's here sometimes it's over there so uh you know trying to like you know understand carbon as a cash or as a nutrient um as a fertility gets fucking super complex dude i mean we now know exudates are are just another form of carbon you know we we've always traditionally looked at them as, you know, carbohydrates and sugars, but what's a carbohydrate and sugar, you know, and then it gets down into fucking proteins and, and that's where shit gets really fucking crazy. You know, proteins fold and they do this, another protein folds, it does that. So these, these interactions get, get really, really complex and uh, to a point where it's almost not predictable about what the outcome is going to be. I mean, a prime example of that is a man and a woman get together, uh, sperm and an egg is exchanged, a youth is born, that the that is repeated. Um, and these two individuals that came, two different individuals that came from the two original individuals are radically different. Well, how the fuck does that happen, right? Because they came from the same basic genetic profile how is their expression so much different? I mean, we, the old joke was, oh, that, that daughter or son definitely came from the milkman, right? Because they don't look anything like their brothers or sisters, or they don't even have the similar, you know, anything, whether it's appearance or uh, beliefs or uh, understandings, knowledge, lack of it. So it, it gets really, really complex. And I think that if you look at carbon as one of the most critical um, components in everything, like I said, anything living has a C to N relation uh, ratio, then that kind of makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, 
the value of carbon. So, you know, carbon can come from a lot of different resources, uh, whether it's the roots, uh, whether it's the, the bacteria or uh, the protozoa. Um, you know, it's 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 just it's it's very, very um, important in, in, in the function of, and evolution of or succession of everything. And I hope I answered that because that, that was a hard one, brother. So from what I understand, when the when the carbon's being built up, there's more glues being built. The glomalin, from again, what I understand is that it, it is produced pretty heavily when it, when all conditions are correct. Mm -hmm. And then as it is being produced heavily, it becomes extremely tough. So some of the analogies have been like if you're in uh, in Florida and then you're constantly watering. So there's a, you know, a tsunami every every other day or so because people are overwatering that the end result on the, the soil microbial level is that the bad guys exist because there's there's turmoil going on within that utopia. Right. So it, the, the bad guys are going to emerge. So that's why a lot of people at the beginning of this had a lot of issues, especially when they were overwatering because the di they were basically killing their diversity killing a lot of that stuff off because they weren't allowing the diversity to take hold because they were continuing to overwater. Once the glomalin is there, supposedly it's the, the glues are so strong that even if you do overwater, you know, a little bit, obviously if you're constantly doing it, it would probably cause issues. But when you do that, the diversity seems to be able to hold on when those so extra tsunamis come through. And then once it passes by, that's why that diversity is able to hold, you know, take over again where the, the bad, the bad guys, if you will, aren't able to take hold. So that's why that immunity uh, is there now. And all of the things that almost sound too good to be true, it seems like it's being attributed to more of the glomalin and more of the bacterial glues that the fungi now kind of takes hold. Things are starting to be built on a rapid basis and the overall health improves quicker. Is that all fair? Um, yeah, yeah. And I think you touched on something that we hadn't um, gotten to yet, and that is um, the value of CO2 in uh, glomulin um, production. So the studies indicate that um, in a higher CO2 environment, that glomulin is easy, easily or easier uh, to produce by, by the, the fungi. And so what is CO2? Carbon, right? Um, so I think that, you know, your analogy of, of the tsunami is, is a great one because uh, in the beginning of this conversation, we talked about the properties of glomulin and, and its ability to form micro and macro aggregates. And then once those aggregates are built, its ability to maintain them without letting them collapse without letting them compact without letting them wash away because it's water resistant so on the outside of that aggregate um if there's too much water it won't let it in it'll let it in a certain amount and hold that amount but it gets to a point where it becomes waterlogged and no longer can water come in so it sheds but that aggregate doesn't fall apart i mean that was one of the um great way of testing soil is to take a, a handful of the soil and put it in water and then pull it out and see how much of that material is now left in that glass of water. If, if, if it was a, a, a macro aggregate that had a tremendous amount of glomulin in it, you could basically put it in and pull it out and the glump would be completely intact. So, Again, there's a uh, there's YouTube videos with that late, and so people can, if they want to do some extra homework with this, uh, they they'll set basically like tilled normal agricultural dirt. I wouldn't even call that soil, and then they'll put uh, like a no till in there, and the the glomalin holds that soil system together while it's in water on top of like a little cage, and then when the agricultural dirt is set on there, it starts to uh, you know go throughout the water system. Uh, almost immediately so it's i mean it, it's a pretty cool uh maybe we should do that as an experiment one day for people to see because it's pretty easy to set up i was able to do it in um in california once but it didn't go as as well as planned uh because 
I, maybe I didn't understand that how delicate that stuff was. So from flying from Denver to, to um, California, uh, it didn't hold up like you normally see in the YouTube videos. So I felt a, like a little egg on my face when I was up there trying to talk about Glomlin at that point. Um, and the demonstration didn't, you know, it was falling <laughs> apart for, a little too quick for what I was trying to show. Uh, but right. it is interesting how that. Remember, like, though, there, there's a critical piece here. Uh, don't give all the credit to Glomlin. You have to give 50% of that credit to biofilm and the bacteria that form the biofilm. It's the combination. Yeah, um, that, it's a that paper, secret that, formula. Yeah, yeah. That, that paper, uh, the last paper I read was really clear on the fact that there are multiple layers of, of this geobiological chemically, chemistry processes that are occurring to allow that glomulin production. So where does the plant start and the dirt start? <laughs> Just, it, it, it's, it's, it's a fucking complex one. Now, they're going to take that word glomulin and break it apart, I, I guarantee it, soon. Um, to the point where we talk about glomulin in soil will be called one thing, and glomulin in the individual spore or, or uh, AM uh, organism will be two different things. And, and it's already started. I think that for the most part, um, the Ackerman is going to be like a four, four word uh, broken down to four letters of, of what it is called in soil. So once it comes out of the body of the organism, it's going to be something different because it's going to have all of these interactions with the, uh, you know, the um, geology, biology, and chemistry that exists in the soil. And then to take this to the next level that like you had mentioned before with the worms, that seems to be where, you know, creating that symphony, uh, you can manage that, that utopia when the composting worms, the springtails, the shredders, when, when everything is kind of introduced, uh, not only on the, the root level, the rhizosphere is there, but then you're concentrating on feeding that uh, by breaking down that organic matter. Uh, that's kind of that, uh, you know, you're, you're the, you're, I guess, getting as close as you can to trying to replicate or move in this succession, like you had mentioned, towards the old growth forest. I've noticed even talking to some of more of the old heads, since they've disturbed the soil so much, uh, rather than maybe uh, like, like Steve, uh, with with other ideas, they were saying that they constantly had to focus on the fungal aspect because they were continuing to disturb it. So it was like they were in this catch 22 where they had to focus on that because they kept disturbing it. The employees are cutting things down. It's a perpetual harvest. Uh, so maybe now if the thinking is going deeper with more of uh, Steve's approach, maybe now we might be able to start to see a variety of different mycorrhizal fungi being developed or, or things falling off different species that could could emerge from some of these guys that are at their like mountain organics is another guy that i think is 25 cycles or more it seems like our community should really focus and hopefully uh support and lift lift, lift up to individuals that have been able to get to that level because i mean I'm, I'm speaking on ignorance here but wouldn't that be where the potential for the ultimate uh utopia is being built is in cycles where they're you know 10 plus maybe 20 plus that that part i don't really know but after things have churned multiple times uh, all of those growers seem like they're growing in basically a rainforest i mean the the stalks are thicker the the, the leaves are bigger a better genetic expression correct correct and i think i think you're you know you're spot on on, on you know that explanation of, of, you know, again, providing the diversity that, that allows um, that kind of uh, expression to happen. And I think, I think more importantly, it goes back to, again, you know, these guys, uh, Steve and others, uh, Mountain Organics, Ian, um, should be sending off root samples to Efren and microroots to have those roots analyzed to determine if he has colonization or not. And if so, um, maybe the next level after that is as um, these testing methods uh, continue to get less and less expensive to actually start sending that uh, 
genetic um, uh, imprint from that specific species of fungi to be paneled and see or try to identify or, or how do I say this? Um, bark meta barcoding is an interesting thing because it doesn't it doesn't tear it all the way down to the individual, but it's more of like, all right, what's around it? What's what's with it? And that's again, we're going in a disciplinary. So you're looking at not just that fungi, you're looking at the fungi, the bacteria, the proteins, and everything that was related to it. Um, what who was there? Who was present? And this gets really fucked up because basically it's a spotlight in time it's basically you're basically going back to the beginning and anything that was there that lived and died there you're going to to have an expression for their dna and therefore that dna will then lead you down the rabbit hole of oh wow it took this many generations and this much succession to get that level of fertility so by leaving your soil intact constantly um you know uh, preventing disturbance, but uh, including the necessary inputs that you need. Um, organic, obviously, you don't want to get into salts, um, but providing that level of uh, geobiochemistry that would occur naturally in a healthy, fertile system. Um, yeah, you're 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 going to go the right direction. But you know, guys like that need to you know also test and uh, and work. Um, or, or try to uh, help lift the rest of the industry or community up by providing data that, hey, I used this product, I had this level of colonization, um, and this is my soil test, so this is my chemistry, here's my uh, biologicals, this is what level of organisms were found, um, and, and now you can start to piece together why it is that that he's doing so well and knocking it out of the park and again you know the, the problem is is that who wants to take the time and spend the money on something that's that's not going to be um a direct um asset to them and it, 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 this gets into generosity like you know giving back to the community um yeah i'm knocking it out of the park and this is how i did it peeps and so you know, maybe maybe the approach is is that as a community, we set out a collection tray and say, hey, everybody send in 10 bucks and you will be you will get access to this information if we raise enough money to do these thorough testing. And, and the, the testing can be quite expensive. I mean, I've got uh, a company that I work with. It's like seven hundred dollars for a compost test. And you say, well, how can that be so expensive? And it's like because they're doing a lot of testing on interactions, not just what's present, but the inner, the ratio of C to N, the ratio of sulfur to nitrogen, all of these different relationships add up to data points that can be mapped out so that you understand what is the fertility of this compost? What is the availability of C to N or, or any one specific nutrient? Um, and why are those relationships so important? Because we all know what nutrient lockout is, right? That's when you have too much of one nutrient and it locks out the other nutrients. Well, the same thing is occurring at certain points during certain successional de-evolution de or evolution. So again, it's, it's a giant moving target, um, but we can, by starting to assemble some of these data points, we can lift up uh, the, or what is it called? Raise the tide. The high tide raises all boats equally, um, which is great for the community because uh, let's face it, man, <laughs> this community is under attack from big ag and they're coming in and they're going to fucking kick ass. I mean, look what happened to the Northern Cal farmers this year. They got fucking crucified from the fucking middleman. They wouldn't pay them the value of what it cost them to grow that product. And so therefore they're going to be stuck with a the product. They're not going to make any money. And these middlemen don't give a shit. They'll just roll in with the fucking crap that's being grown indoor. And then as soon as the fucking state borders open up, those indoor guys are going to crash. And then who's, who's going to buy them up on pennies on a dollar? Big fucking money, big ag, big pharma. And so onward and upward of just nutrients cycling the little guy into the fucking soil. And 
So as a community, um, if you start, if we start to work toward these types of goals so that nobody has to fucking buy weed from a dispensary, they're going to go out of fucking business. If everybody can grow six plants and they do, then you can trade your plant to someone else or you can trade your genetic to someone else. Um, barter, like we talked about, uh, was it last week or the week before? I mean, if we were all bartering, guess what? Fuck the government. They ain't getting no taxes and they don't like that shit. I got audited by the IRS and I was asked point blank if I've ever bartered. And I just looked at him and said, um, excuse me, but you work for a government, correct? And she was like, yeah. Well, you're government barters. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, you ever heard of campaign finance? Have you ever heard of the relationships between governments and individuals and lobbyists? Well, what the fuck is that? Lobbyist says, here, here's a bunch of money. Pass this law to help my client. That's, that's a fucking barter if I've ever heard one. So, you know, no, I've never bartered. And yeah, I'll barter if I can. And she did not like that fucking answer. I'll tell you that right now. But I think that in many ways, that that is what this community is going to need to do moving forward, is to protect each other from getting picked off. Form, form glomulin, man. Just form a big fucking glue ball of, of, you know, love and happiness and sharing. Barbara. That's secretly something I've been afraid of for a few years now is that dispensaries would just turn to, to the big farmers. Uh, they only care about price. Um, and that's why I hope that more and more people just start to grow, even if it's, you know, a tent or two or, you know, a four by four and just start to manage something so that you do have the skill set or you're at least developing the skill set if something does go awry. One of my uh, dispensaries I still frequent sometimes, I'm looking at their nugs over the years, it seems like they have major compaction issues it, it, across the board. Whatever genetics you're looking at, the nugs are about this big. And there's supposedly a living soil facility in Pueblo and um, all of those all of those things. But it seems like the individual doesn't. I mean, I would imagine that they know that, but I don't, it seems like they don't know how to fix that. And so for a lot of these living soil farms, when things do go awry and the, the head individual doesn't know how to fix it, I think that's why some of the, the suits and the, the deep pocketed individuals are afraid to go the living soil route on a, on a grand scale uh, because when it is explained to them, sometimes the, the farmer themselves can't explain why this is better or why, you know, using mycorrhizal fungi would be a benefit. Uh, a, a lot of the older heads too, they just knew like product names and, and brand names of, of products. So this is, as a community, I've, I, this is kind of uh, the new, especially for the younger individuals, this is your time to shine. Uh, there's a little door, a gateway that's opened up for kind of the new generation. And if you guys take it and run with it, uh, I know that there's going to be a lot of successful people out there just because the community, uh, as well as the consumer, is starting to understand that this is medicine. And then if they are just a weekend smoker, they do want to have a, uh, the quality stuff for the most part, it seems like, especially here in Denver, we have higher end dispensaries where you have to spend like a thousand bucks a month even to be in their little VIP program. So um, there's people out there that are willing to pay. Um, and and I, also there are people that are wanting like lower budgeted stuff. But for the most part, when you're growing your own cannabis, and that's, I guess, kind of what we're hopefully getting through by uh, this show every week. Uh, you're going to be able to dictate all of that stuff. You're going to be able to grow the genetics that you've always seeked. Uh, and and the, the fun part of this is that you can grow some of the cheaper genetics or genetics you've had for a while, uh, hone your skills. And then eventually when your soil system is alive and thriving, you feel like it's at its best. That's when I would go and pheno hunt. Uh, and again, you're going to be up to deciding about those full genetic uh, profile expressions. Uh, but you're going to have a better canvas to judge, uh, you know, the breeder's artwork from. Uh, and that's going to make you a better cannabis breeder from day one uh, because genetics is really where it's at. And for a lot of us, especially at the beginning of the first few years, we were just passing around watered down genetics, trying to grow it better than our, you know, than our peers and then make a little money for ourselves. Uh, where now you can be so proactive that you could get the genetics you needed, your worm farming, you're building up uh, your soil systems, you're understanding bacteria to fungal ratios, um, you know, and you're maybe a year, maybe six months into farming, you're going to be a, such a better farmer than, than any one of my peer group 
uh, just from that standpoint alone. And then I hope that you guys continue to pass on that information so that more and more people do feel that they can grow cannabis for themselves. You know, you brought up a really interesting point, Brian. Um, I've noticed a similar uh, phenomenon in, in dispensaries. It's all about the popcorn, right? Everybody's got these little fucking nuggets. And <clears throat> let me throw a question out there. Um, is it due to packaging? Because it's easier to pack little nuggets than it is a big butt, right? Right. But you can you can tell that it's it's degraded over the years. And then their answer is, is that they, they chop it up so much uh, because they don't want anybody complaining about stems and that kind of thing. Uh, but the nuggets are are comically little for really almost any dispensary that you go to in Denver. Yeah. yeah. So, so back to packaging, it's a lot easier to package little fucking marbles than it is to package. A big right. Dick. So why fix it? I guess is what, what you're kind of getting at. Right. Well, I, again, I think it's just the approach or the, the economics behind it. And, and again, you know, the, the, these, larger facilities don't give a flying fuck about quality. It's just about quantity. And I don't know how many facilities I've been to, and it's the same fucking story. Don't worry about it. Just push it the fuck out the door. Grow it, grow it, grow it. If I can, if I can take this shit down early and, and produce a whole other run in the course of a year, well, my profits just went up exponentially because I snuck another run in. Or maybe I only got half a run in. But either way, did you... Did you let the 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 plant fully uh, express what it could have? No, because it's just get it in, get it out, get it in, get it out. And these little things, these little tiny nuggets, fit really easily in these little jars. Um, so perhaps it is a lot more about um, the economic side of of growth instead of the traditional side of growth, which was look how big my fucking nugget is, right? Um, so maybe that's part of it. But I agree with you that for whatever reason, um, this approach to uh, larger cannabis production companies has always been about um, fuck living soil, just nuke it with fucking chemicals. And I don't care if I'm polluting the environment every time I dump uh, half half baked nutrients into the into the water system. I mean, seriously, cannabis production is one of the most detrimental uh, things that humanity can do in, in scale because they're, they're hydroponically, they run it till the nutrients get to a certain level. And then they're afraid that they're going to have a nutrient crash. So they dump it and add fresh newts in. And where does that newt go right out into the fucking oceans, rivers, and, you know, through, through the wastewater treatment plant, but the wastewater treatment plant isn't re removing all that shit. I mean, dude, I could horrify you on the shit that they do as far as parts per million of nitrogen and phosphorus that's being released. And, and it used to be it used to be all around all about nitrogen. So the companies would uh, would get water tested once a year. Uh, feds would come out, take a water sample, run it for nitrate. Um, and they would say, oh, you're, you're, you're passed or you didn't pass. And if you didn't pass, you got a little fine. So no big deal. Right. And meanwhile, then they switched it to phosphorus. Um, so now nitrogen isn't even being fucking looked at. So now it's pretty much wide open what you're dumping out into the into the um, oceans and rivers and lakes. Um, once you're done through uh, you're gone through your water purification. And that's not even including pharmaceuticals. There is no test for pharmaceuticals at this point. So, yeah, I think that that is the that is the issue is that if if you look at cannabis production, is it coming from love or is it coming from money? And that's where you'll have a huge difference in quantity uh, over quality. Um, well, we we got to find that bridge uh, to, to kind of meet the suits halfway where we can kind of explain to things, you know, if you're, if you're willing to believe in this team, this system for three years, that's why we always kind of use the, the analogy of the NFL. You know, you got to believe in your team for a few years to really build anything of quality. Otherwise, you know, you're changing coaches, you're changing star quarterbacks or whatever. And the, the chemistry isn't there, you know, you can buy all the athletes you want, but the chemistry still has to be there. Usually in those, you know, I guess I'm speaking, I only really follow the NFL, but the, the way that the, that whole thing is structured 
is that the bad teams benefit, the good teams are are hurt with like the way that things are done. So that there's a balance there that people stay stay interested compared to other sports where a dynasty can be built. Um, but cannabis, f- when things are being put out to this, I hope that some of those older heads, some of the gentlemen that we had mentioned, they're kind of like the dynasties, the, the people that we're trying to watch to see uh, what can be achieved. And I hope that more of the deep pocketed individuals find out about those names or find out about their grows, uh, or maybe we can find ways to get more of that out there because I, I've, I've sat in meetings where when you, when a, when an owner with deep pockets is willing to really sit down and listen to what you're trying to say and the meetings longer than 30 minutes, and they're actually asking real questions about what can be achieved there are a lot of light bulbs that click off when they've owned uh, hydroponic facilities or, you know, they've just owned or managed a bunch of dispensaries. Now they're trying to, to go fully integrated. Uh, they do understand all of the nuances that, that cannabis brings. So when you do break it down like that, I, I, I feel like there'd be more opportunity for the community if we can find more of leaders uh, that are, are so what politicians or people that we're following to see where things can go uh, because the community has to find somebody, a voice that's going to speak for the living soil where there's enough data, like you had mentioned, where we can show that that things are improving and the money will follow because it, it's I don't know if you guys have been out you know, to Vegas, check out Steve's cannabis. But there's a reason why that stuff is everywhere. Um, and to be able to grow that in the desert. I mean, there you go. Right. I mean, you could most commercial facilities around the country, if that's being done in the desert, could could easily handle it uh, anywhere in the country. Agreed, 100. percent I think I think getting the suits to meet you halfway is the is the hard part because it's usually their way or the highway. Um, and but- we're from a business standpoint, we're kind of naive, don't you think? Myself included. Like when you when you go out and help individuals, you've helped them set things up. After a while, uh, they might not need you. They don't need you as much as they thought you did. Um, I guess the real beauty of that is, is that when you when you remove some of the the quarterbacks or the people running the more of the day to day operations, uh, the system fails. It, it, I honestly haven't seen a system be successful unless there are tried and true individuals. Uh, you know. Steve said he's worked with like the same individuals for over 10 years. That's the kind of shit that I, I feel like you have to understand as a deep pocketed individual. You have to have people that are willing and wanting to work for you for years on end to really see this thing shine through. And that's the difference from from a suits point of view is because some of the bullshit names here in Colorado, the turnover is so high that you rarely even especially even when you go to the dispensaries, you rarely see the same people anymore. No one wants to work. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of variables that I feel like are potentially hurting uh, this from just exploding with the deep pocketed individuals. Uh, they don't understand the process. And then at the same time, there are just a few people that are, you know, 25 cycles plus. So I think the answer to that, Brian, is really the fact that there's two things here, team building and big business. Big business, you go to a business school, they tell you point blank, your job is to get to the top. And that includes stepping on every single person on the way up. If you don't take their ideas and bring it to the boss first, shame on you. You're not going to get the promotion. Um, If you are a manager and you're managing these people, everything that those people underneath you come up with is yours. You take that to the next level. So it's, it's business is all about individual, uh, ego, uh, self-interest where team building is the opposite. Team building is like, I want to lift all of us up together. I want, I might be the quarterback, but I need my running backs. I need my receivers. I need my defense, my, my line. Cause I ain't going to fucking get shit done. If, if I'm not protected and have the assets to move this ball to the other end of the field. So there, it's, it's, it's two different things and two completely radically different ideas of, of how to do something. I mean, dude, in the last two years, the richest people in the world have increased their holdings exponentially. 
That's the difference between business and teams. Those same teams that, that we talked about, whether they're NFL, NBA, whatever, you don't see them taking that same approach. Their owners are, are figuring out how to build a team that will win so that they can sell more paraphernalia and swag and all that shit. But the team itself is, is trying to bond each other so that I know what you're thinking before you think it. So that, I, so that we are acting as one, not as individuals. So there's, there's the that, answer to that problem. And that's the kind of the underlying thing that hopefully more um, like head growers and stuff will realize is that you have to believe in everybody on your team and their contract needs to be like a year or two. Or if it's somebody that you truly believe in, that probably does need to be three, four years where you're uh, in a bond working together side by side uh, because true magic is starting to develop there and more and more individuals that are farming uh, later three years, four years, five years into this uh, in Denver on an underground level, uh, those guys are smiling ear to ear. You know, they put in all this work when we were first discovering this stuff and now they are living fantastic and, and doing things for their family. And um, it's not necessarily material things, but they're able to, you know, buy organic foods and just, just the little things in life that probably will just make your, your health a little bit better, more ways to go out there and, and probably do even more things uh, for your family and yourself. Uh, and like London there with, you know, I saw you with your daughter and that's, that's what it's really about is trying to grow the best food and the group, you know, grow maybe this, the best medicine that you can for yourself so that you can take care of your family. I personally know that I, you know, I enjoy smoking cannabis so that I can work uh, and continue to do a, a variety of things throughout the day and still kind of maybe selfishly enjoy myself by being stoned. Uh, but it allows me to stay productive. And I, I do feel like there's, just as many people that use cannabis on that side of things as it was, you know, when I was in high school and everybody felt like if you were a stoner that you just didn't do anything. Um, but for some of us out there, that's very far from what our goal is when we're using cannabis. It's more to just kind of stay focused. we got so much shit going on. I, I need to dial in uh, for an hour or two kind of thing. So uh, let, let's start by uh, growing our own food, growing our own medicine. Uh, and hopefully, um, maybe I could reach out to Steve uh, Steensland, uh, Ian, and if it is seven hundred dollars, I don't. Know, we definitely need to probably reach out to the community for that, or maybe we could uh, find a lab that would be willing to donate it, something like that. Layton, kind of just shooting oh, the shit live here. That but. was Brian. That was only one test. Yeah, uh, you're talking a couple of grand to really do a full workup on everything from mycorrhizae colonization, soil food web, soil chemistry, uh, composition of your O-horizon, because more often than not, we are growing in what would be considered a substrate of organic matter. And notice I didn't use the word compost because compost is a process. It isn't an end result uh, or it isn't a product. Um, so there's various stages of decomposition. Um, and I, would do, I did a couple shows on that. I had podcasts last week or this week, actually. I don't even remember where I am. But the bottom line is that, yeah, it's it would be expensive to do, um, but it would definitely begin to prove to, to deep-pocketed individuals that they could produce a higher grade, um, a higher value product if they even want one. So I think that's, you know, the other side of the coin is that a lot of these guys don't care about the quality of it. It's just about, again, quantity, pushing it out, pushing it out, making more money. Um, but I'm sure that, you know, as as, you know, the beer industry took over itself, they created a niche called craft and that craft uh, became as big or and as lucrative as the Budweiser and the Coors. Uh, that you could buy for short money, but people voted with their wallet and chose to buy that Sam Adams or that microbrewery that popped up in your town. Um, so the consumer out there would probably take advantage of the opportunity to buy something that was organic, organically grown, um, that's kind of the problem with dispensaries, though, is that, um, at least here, the way it's set up in Colorado, 
they're basically pitching you that it's craft beer and selling you the the yeah. Coors Light, Bud Light, and you're not able to smell it or, um, you know, I guess you can look at it through a jar. Not uh, don't. But if it was just on a shelf, I know for certain that the the craft cannabis movement would have accelerated, you know, even just these past few years on a, a much higher level. Uh, because when you do... I guess this is more more before COVID when you would meet up with a lot of individuals at, at some of these expos and stuff, everybody wants to show their stuff off. And for some individuals, I feel like it was a, a rude awakening when they would meet some of these, like some of these guys are cannabis legends, you know, they come from Indo Expo, we're all hanging out, they pull their weed out or they pulled their hash out. This one gentleman, it was as dark as dark could be, you know? So there's still so much misinformation and, and stuff and the commercial side of things, the dispensary side of things are on this side where the living soil, where we're all kind of buddies when we see each other, I've never seen better cannabis in my life being showed by, you know, 10 individuals hanging out with each other than I have with more of like the KNF living soil, all of the acronyms. So nobody gets upset. The biodynamic crews, all of those individuals that put love and effort into it, whatever your ideology kind of thing is, uh, that cannabis, th those end results um, are, have always been far superior than uh, most of the salt guys that, that I know. And unless they really understood the plant itself, um, it was really hard for those guys to compete. And that's why in the underground side of things here in Denver, uh, living soil is popping. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And, and that's the problem is that um, for whatever reason, the individuals have been locked out for the most part of the process of getting their product in and on shelves. Um, so the other big problem is that the dispensary wants consistency. So they want you to just run the same clones, the same genetic over and over and over again. So that if you like this cultivar, you can come back two weeks later and buy the same cultivar. Well, that's just not realistic in this plan. Um, and, and again, you're right, man. You, 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 you smoke side by side chem bud versus bio bud, and you'll never go back to chem bud. But how do you get bio bud in the hands of masses? Um, the only way is to break that concrete box that's around the distribution system um, and get it into the people's hands that, that have to go to a dispensary to purchase it. Um, otherwise, you're just you're you're and why, why is the black market thriving? Because of these problems. It's it's bigger and better and badder than it ever was. Um, and fortunately, I think that the, a lot of the stigma behind cannabis is gone. Like, oh, cannabis is a gateway drug. That's gone. I don't hear that anymore. Um, for the most part, even older people are having conversation about this plant and the medical benefits of it, whether it's CBD or THC or a combination of both. Um, I, I know more and more people who my age uh, communicate this with their parents, which was taboo. Uh, you know, we were growing up, man, this was like your parents caught you smoking weed. And that was a fucking huge problem. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's not it's not as 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 big of a deal it's like uh people that are a little older than me um that have children you know in their 20s or uh, 30s they, they, and know that their kids smoke cannabis it's not again it's not like they're gonna freak out on you and, you know, the next generation behind me that has children in their teens, again, I think that if they got caught smoking cannabis, as long as their, their approach to life was, was appropriate and not like just smoking weed, laying on the couch, eating all day. But if they were functioning, you know, getting a job, working, school, doing their homework, whatever, I don't see it as being that, that issue that it was when I was growing up. So I think in many ways, cannabis has lost a lot of it's stigma. Um, I think it's going to be really beneficial when the feds finally fucking legalize it, which I still to this day don't understand why, other than the fact I believe it's money and control of power. Um, I mean, why else would they hold this plant back <clears throat> when so many states have legalized it? But, you know, again, these are, you know, big geopolitical pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. 
I feel like a lot of people we've had, I've had several discussions with people on that where uh, their feeling was, is that the pharmaceutical companies could care less if everybody's hanging out, getting stoned, sitting on the couch. Their, their issue is that the more and more of the masses are starting to understand about different cannabinoids and that there's actually like a beneficial, you, you know, even my own mother-in-law, she just visited like a week ago. Uh, she was terrified of how, even doing CBD until she came out here. We explained it to her. Um, and she was able to try some of that. And now she's, you know, she, she ordered some shout out to moon mother hemp quality products, uh, where same thing with my mother, you know, like they just didn't understand cannabis. So when you talk about other cannabinoids as health, they still viewed it as well. Even if it is a health benefit, I don't want to get high, uh, which is, you know, obviously silly to this crowd. Uh, but the education for the older generations are, are is still not there. And the misinformation that so many of them still have, um, you know, going to, to parties and stuff or, or family reunions when people find out uh, that I grew that I grew cannabis, uh, the questions come out because the health benefits when you get older, you know, you're tired of taking all of those pills or feeling like a zombie by taking opiates or whatever. You know, my, my grandfather passed away from, from shingles, but I feel like you, he, he missed probably a whole maybe year, year and a half of his life. Cause he was just on opiates the entire time. So mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, he's alive, but yeah. What's his like, quality of life? Right? right. And so they're just charging, draining my uh, grandparents savings. Yep. Uh, getting the you know the last little bit out of it so yeah so it's really sad to see and that's why we're on the crusade every thursday is you guys gotta you gotta realize that the food is extremely important um, the nutritional level especially as you're getting older nobody ever taught this to me uh, and i hope that that's something that i continue to teach the community as well as the cannabis stuff because once you start to feel good there's so many things in your life that that will open up for you I wanted to uh, bring London in on this uh, to kind of talk more from the BC side of things in Vancouver. Uh, what are your views like in your peer group? Is it the living soil is starting to take hold? The smaller communities are wanting to, to farm in this manner? Or is it still uh, salts up there as well? Well, there's a lot of salts. Uh, most of it is salts. You go in a hydroponic store, the first thing you can see is a wall of green planet. So the interesting thing about BC is we have kind of the, a, a very diverse culture when it comes to plants and organics and stuff like that. Now, our food scene is probably in some ways a little bit further ahead when it comes to um, regenerative or organic practices of, of you know, farming and, and taking care of the land. Whereas cannabis, because we have like Remo, Green Planet, we have a high saturation of, of bottle nutrient companies in this space. You're talking like three of them. No, Remo, I know is based out of BC. Green Planet, I know is based out of BC Canada. So these guys are in like every farm on a regular basis with a large sales team hitting them out there. So it's, it's the first thing people see when they get into this space. So there are a few places out in Chilliwack um, that are doing the food movement. Like I like I, I mentioned earlier, as a chef, a lot of the restaurants uh, were, were starting to get pursued by organic producers that were doing regenerative practices, no-till practices. But even so, that verbiage wasn't really being put around and still isn't re really being put around. And I actually wanted to kind of pose an, a, a, an angle of question because you mentioned that this is a great way to to educate people and find that health in their life because of course we we, we dive deeper into these plants and caring for them but also realize that the, there's a great difference in 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 what the resulting product is out of it and then we incorporate that in other elements of our life right and one of the big challenges in the food space and food industry is we believe the same things and and there's this great pipe price differential that makes things a lot more challenging and, and approachable to get into. One of the things is that the cost per acre is, is a little bit more of a challenge for your organic or regenerative grower. They're not getting quite as much yield out of it. So they often have to charge more, but the, there's also not the benefit of as many people purchasing the product. So I noticed as they grow and develop, prices started to come down. Your, your, your vegetable prices now, which is really interesting because of COVID and all these other problems and issues, like we were cut off from the rest of the world for a little bit here in BC because of floods and, and this and that and the other. And it, it actually 
really helped some of the local farmers because these guys had consistently cost and and, and price price affordable products. Now that all all of our products that are being long distance shipped out of town that are filling our grocery stores, going to your regular grocery store and hitting the same vegetable prices in there that your organic producers are hitting now. So we're seeing that kind of evolution and change happening forward. And one of the aspects that I see in, as, as a great entertainment it, it, as a a great route to kind of this forward slow food movement, you know, local food movement um, is cannabis in the, in, in the way it's cool. It's fun. It's got this major social following. People love listening. People love talking about it. How do we step forward? You know, how, what's the, what's the next few steps do we think to, to get this organic and regenerative movement and use both of these avenues together? Cause we're both talking the same message. It's the same idea that we, the, the way that we take care of our plants, what's in them and what's around them produces a healthier lifestyle. And same with the cannabis. It, it just seems the, the narrative is so similar. I'm wondering how can we integrate this and how can we make that work forward? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, we've, we've talked a lot about that. The, the problem is, um, look at, look at the, the living soils community. You got the biodynamics, you got soil food web, you got natural farming, and they're all arguing with each other. You know, it, it's, it, it's, I, I fear it's just the nature of humanity that it's, it's got to be my way or the highway. And it's crazy. Um, and, you know, since I started, you know, really, delving down the cannabis community. I've always said that the, the potential for the cannabis plant to shape the mindset of humanity is real and huge because look at, look at where the cannabis community is now versus where they were 10 years ago. Um, most often, if not all the time, uh, these living soils, um, People are also have a food garden of some kind or, or fruit trees of some kind. So the, they're interchangeable. Yes. Um, when is that ever going to complete the cycle? I guess when, when every farmer starts growing hemp, um, whether it's for fiber, for medicine or for feed, I mean, we've really got to get the hemp or, or cannabis because it's the fucking same thing. Cannabis back into feeding our animals um saying that I yeah no, it's, that. I, you know, I, I fall down that rabbit hole too um you know it's thc or, or cbd but it's the fucking same damn plant and if, if 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 we can get that plant back into our food chain um the benefits medically would be huge but again the pharmaceuticals want to keep us sick they don't want us to make us fucking healthy so you're really fighting, you're fighting a system that's, that's in power and in place um, to make changes that would go against their business decisions and their, their profitability and their, and their shareholders. So in order to, in order to stop it all, you, you know, it goes back to one thing, money. If, if money was abolished, then we wouldn't be having these conversations. Everybody would be eating nutrient dense food. Um, and it wouldn't be all about me, me and, and look at my house, look at my mansion, look at my car, you know? So I, I don't, I don't know is that problem will ever get solved. I think that it will ease over time. But again, those first steps, those first fucking steps are get, you know, Steve and Joshua Steenslins and, uh, Ian and some of these other guys to open up their fucking operation to a real, you know, deep dive of, of testing and, and exposing, you know, what's going on. Why am I getting these levels of cannabinoids? Why am I, why is my cultivar grown in this environment and the same cultivar grown in a um, chemistry based environment have such a huge difference in expression? And the, the only way to do that is to do these, you know, expensive, uh, exhausting, um, cross-disciplinary tests to really determine, you know, this complex geochemical biological process and, and why it's happening. But at the end result, who are you, who, who's going to get this information? The little guys that, 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 which is great because again, you know, next generation or <laughs> God willing, 
you know, we, we survive the next couple of generations, but eventually, you know, I, I tend to believe that, that, that cannabis will be way more of a mainstream in the future than it is right now. And that stigma of, oh, you're a stonehead will, will disappear because pretty much anybody that smokes weed could turn around and say, you're a fucking alcoholic. I mean, literally look at, look at, look at what is labeled as an alcoholic, somebody that consumes uh, alcohol every day, glass of wine, beer, whatever. And it's even worse. It's like, I think if you consume, you know, X amount of ounces over the course of a week, that's considered an alcoholic. Fucking this planet is alcoholic. Everybody's fucking an alcoholic. I mean, the amount of people I see consuming that and that's okay, right? That's okay. But smoking cannabis is not, you know, that again is, is manipulation um, by, by people of power in position to, to manipulate. Can, can I touch on that about a really kind of interesting situation? I don't know if you guys have seen this here, but in Canada, you're not allowed to have your children come into the dispensaries. And these are very nice, posh, you like they look like fucking Apple stores, to be frank. They're, they're very, you know, glass, everything's nice and, and set up and behind glass. And you're not even allowed to have your kid come in. And a matter of fact, because of, of the, the, the laws here, you're not allowed to have an attendant that works there watch your child outside while you're in there. So we have a, a cannabis store on the same kind of pavilion as a liquor store, which had to fight all the town hall just to get position there in, in a place where cannabis is 100% legal in Canada. So first they had to fight the town hall. And then on top of all this, so if I was a single parent without, without child care and I had to go to the store, you're, legally I would have to leave my child in the vehicle for me to be able to go in but that's not like you don't leave your kid in the fucking car that's not that's not safe that's not right so i i'm not allowed to go now i'm not allowed to go to the dispensary because i don't have child care to watch watch out for it. meanwhile I, I you could sit in front of that liquor store and watch parents utilize their children to carry their liquor to the car <laughs> now i i don't have an issue with that but why can't you know a mom who's having her stressful day that single mother with two kids that's going through fucking hell not be able to pick up some weed on their way home from work to relax because last time i checked i'm okay with people smoking cannabis in, in front of my children but i if they were wasted the there's a completely different situation um you know like i just don't get it it just it's so weird and it seems so out of place and it's so contextually fucked up <laughs> and it's just that that change that division that we continue and that you mentioned earlier with the separate areas and we all we all like there's ickiness with certain stuff like oh you know dog poops icky you know like who fucking cares fish poops fine aquaponics is fucking awesome <laughs> like there's all these other methodologies and we all like we have these context context this is in our head like, oh, there's bugs. I'm going to put bugs in my garden. Now there's bugs all over the place. and I'm grossed out by bugs. Well, guess what? We've been living with fucking bugs longer than we've been living without. The Korean freak generation with my parents and, and the parents before that. It's like all of a sudden we wash everything with bleach, hydrogen peroxide, and fucking staying clean at all. right? And I wonder what that damage did to did to everything in the long run of, of you know, our endocannabinoids. Not just our endocannabinoids, just taking away the THC, but also like our epigenetics. Like what? has those stressors of having zero bacterial influence on us at points in time with during our youth what does that affect on us in the long run and is that going to affect our our children or our children's children in the long run i mean there's so many levels to this it's insane to think about and and unfortunately i do have about seven minutes as a heads up before i have to run my daughter to swimming um so we do have to ha kind of hit hit the two hour mark today unfortunately guys I'm sorry about that that's right. Uh, that's no problem, man. This is a complex subject. There, people have been asking for this for months. So the fact that we could even address it, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm grateful because hopefully there'll be others that might be able to add to this or point us in the right direction for somebody that could really break this down. Uh, like I said, I can definitely reach out to my study group, and they'll they'll have a lot more of the uh, intricacies. But I think that you know the conversation is so complex that. You know, it's got to start with like, you got to keep your mind wide open. Again, it's, it's, it's all of these things coming together that are creating this um, unique glue. Um, but again, it, it can't be the same in 
the spore or in the hyphae as it is in the soil. That's clear. So that that piece of the conversation is, is just as important because the people that are asking you this, Brian, are looking for what is it in the soil, not what it is in the, the spore or the, the individual organism, uh, because that really doesn't matter. But it's what's excreted and the end result of glomulin that's that's so valuable in, in building soil structure. So that's where that's where the next conversation will 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 get a lot more complex and deep. But again, if you could keep your mind open to the fact that, you know, there's three three main pieces to this. It's it's geo, which is, you know, minerals and, and sand, silk, clay and organic matter, biological and not just one species, but multiple levels of species and chemistry, what's available chemically in the soil. And London, you know, to your point, man. We, we have done such damage uh, just to the, to the diversity of insects on this planet. I mean, you want to talk about horrifying um, the, you know, we're definitely in the sixth extinction. And as far as the bugs are concerned, they're, they're fucking halfway through it. Um, we have, we have literally wiped so many different um, varieties and species and subspecies of, of insects. It's not even funny. Um, from all the pesticides because, you know, we went with chemistry and then all of a sudden chemistry through through the bug populations out of whack because they, the plants were all sickly. So they multiplied, you know, these things called pests, which really aren't in nature. They're just there to break shit down that isn't healthy for, for the consumers to consume. So it, we, we literally like created this this infestation of, of pests, or, which really aren't pests again. It's so bad. I say I, I am so ingrained with that mentality that I say pests when speaking about predatory insects. I have to correct my verbiage often because I was awful. I was trained like from birth, like, oh, my God, it's a bug. Kill it. Like that, like my mother on it on a fucking table, freaking the fuck out. And now it's <laughs> like I have mantises crawling on my hand and I'm like, I'm trying to. And, and this is like my grown birth. This is my life. This is like part of it. So like trying to get past these little inferences is so challenging. Oh yeah. Like, like calling hemp hemp. <laughs> uh, we had a fantastic discussion on praying mantis yesterday for people that weren't able to check that out. Um, there's a variety of them out there that are going to be more cost effective for you. So don't waste your money. Like a lot of us did going to the high end garden centers, uh, check out, um, his name is Zach. So check that one out as well. Um, there's just a lot of information that's been going out. Uh, shout out to you, London, as well, man, putting out um, information each and every week, hosting shows. Uh, shout out to Chad Westport as well. This this has become something pretty pretty cool to be a part of, Leighton, and it, it's cool that uh, it just continues to grow, man. This is exactly like it's almost like we're we're showing proof that this is how the soil microbial world grows. It's through org organic, you know. It's, it's naturally occurring. People talk about the show. Other individuals want to be a part of it. More information is being put out. Uh, better questions, better topic discussions are being asked. You know, people are wanting to dive deeper into very complex subjects. And we're going to always try to answer that or, or try as best we can to explain those things for you. Uh, because we do want you to feel confident to just grow for yourself. Uh, the, the main thing of this show and, and other shows that I'm a part of is that we, we just want you guys to try it uh, and give feedback to us and, and let us know how things are working. Yeah, I'm into that, brother. I'm into that. And as a community, hopefully we uh, can create some competition against this, you know, hypocritical, unfair system that does not allow um, cannabis to be looked at, viewed as similar to alcohol better yet a plant like that just is like grows next to my damn tomatoes like, literally <laughs> a tomato right there <laughs> to, to prove a point fucking love it love it uh, appreciate you guys man you guys do put on awesome awesome shows it's so cool because i've watched you guys a bunch and it, it, it's really neat to be like the little dude in the corner helping out <laughs> and i appreciate <laughs> being part of it guys and it, it, it it's awesome and the chat is is blown up with positive stuff so like i i i, I couldn't lift them all their shadow check uh man laura i'm doing it super fast so that everybody can kind of <laughs> get in there which is great we appreciate oh, it yes that's uh, a good yeah, people. Yeah, we appreciate all of you guys. Uh, this is a community that's being built from the ground up. 
Um, it's even cool that they kind of named this Living Soil Conversations because it really has just become conversations, finding viewpoints, finding things that we should dive deeper into. Uh, and I appreciate all of you that continue to give me topic ideas or want discussions. And I hope that especially after today, you guys see that I'm trying to follow through as best I can and find the guests or the uh, topics uh, that you want to hear. Uh, I understand that whatever it takes that, you know, for almost every living soil, natural farmer, biodynamic farmer, uh, there is some kind of switch paradigm shift, uh, something that you read or something that you hear where you just believe in that part. And that's really the end goal uh, for a lot of this stuff is that once you've kind of drank the Kool-Aid, if you will, you're going to run with this, tell uh, a variety of friends once you've experienced, uh, you know, the end results. Uh, and then the, that's my personal mission when we even first started this is that's the only way i know that from a grassroots point of view we would be able to fight big ag uh, is by information uh, because they can't take that shit from you and then we decide how much we want to distribute and then that like my point earlier more and more people are wanting to get involved then you know that the the hunger is out there and there's more individuals that see the value in spending a couple hours uh, of their day, uh, of their day, uh, each and every week, understanding these concepts so that they can minimize years, uh, especially when you're new to this. Amen. Oh, great words, brother. Great words. Uh, <clears throat> and I think I think you do. It's bold. This is a bold thing to do. I'll just say, when it comes to like complex subjects like this, we did we we dove into epigenetics like last week on the Dank Hour, and I was like, it, our our doctor Anubis who like you know, did some work with it, epigenetics and had the deepest understanding of it was like our lead conversation piece. And she had trouble for like the first 20 minutes of the show. I'm like, well, I like kind of get it um, and trying to have a topic and, 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 and realize that. And I like how you said it at the beginning there is this is a discussion on something that it will continue forward and that we're just we're just discussing and learning and everybody's just discussing and learning and that we can talk about it and, and discuss and learn it together that's that's the cool part being on that feeling uh, the feeling of being on that forefront is amazing to be a part of um, so thank you guys shall we shall we call it at that yeah sounds good peace out everybody we'll see you next week yeah appreciate uh, you uh, guest host in london shout out to yeah you. it was fun brother and i'll see you next tuesday right